Our reading this morning will come from the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, we begin from verse 1 to verse 12. Acts 2, verse 1 to verse 12, and I'll read. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, they were staying in Jerusalem, God fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one had their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, and all these who are speaking Galileans, then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both the Jews and converts of Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own, in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask each other, what does this mean? This is the word of the Lord. Good morning and praise the Lord. I want to thank God that uh, he has given us yet another new morning and we can confidently say this is the day that the Lord has made. We shall be glad and rejoice in it. Indeed, our God is faithful. He has brought us this far and in him, like we say, we live, we move and we have our beings. So we have confidence that whoever we follow, uh, that is God himself whom we follow, is a faithful God whom is the, who is dependable and whom we can depend on. Uh, we have just received a, a scripture reading from, the, uh, from Acts chapter 2, the Acts of the Apostles chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. And the passage is talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit. I would want to discuss about that Holy Spirit, coming of the Holy Spirit, and what he does, the ministry of the Holy Spirit to an individual. Let us pray. Speak to us, our gracious Heavenly Father, and may the, may the meditations of my words and the words of my mouth be, accepted, be acceptable before you, O God. Let your Holy Spirit reveal yourself, Lord, to us, and that, Lord, when we leave this place, we'll be blessed of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 From the reading that we have just made, we know that the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost, the Jews would gather in Jerusalem uh, because they had their own celebrations. Again, we know that on the day of Pentecost, it is talking about 50 days, Pente, 50 days from the time that Christ had resurrected. So the believers are together, gathered in Jerusalem, in the upper room, they had been given instructions by Jesus Christ when he was ascending that they should not leave Jerusalem before they are indwelled or before the coming of the Holy Spirit. So on this particular day, and it was early in the morning, the Holy Spirit came in form of wind and tongues of fire and rested upon them. So these guys begin to speak or they began to speak in new Times that were understood, they were understood by those people who had visited Jerusalem. They spoke in new tongues, and the visitors of Jerusalem heard them and understood them speaking in their native language. So the question of speaking in tongues begins there. But remember that these are tongues that were also understood by those who listened, who heard them. I want to let ask a different question. When the Holy Spirit comes into an individual, when he rests, because it is not a need, it's a person, when he rests in an individual, what does he do to us? The first thing that we need to remember is that Christ had really taught about the Holy Spirit. If you read the book of John, the Gospel according to St. John, 
chapter 14 uh, and all the way from chapter 14, uh, 15, 16 there about, you hear the many things that he talked about. For example, in John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17, this is what Christ would tell them. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you will know him, for he lives with you and will be with you. And that is the first thing that happens. He comes, the Holy Spirit comes and indwells in us. And you can still read this from the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 11, and also 1 Corinthians, chapter 6, verses 19. The second thing uh, that he does is conviction. The Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. No one can come to the Lord unless it is through the conviction of the Holy Spirit. If you read John chapter 16, verses 7 to 11, you will hear how Christ talked about this. But I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin, and righteousness and judgment in regard to sin, because men do not believe in me in regard to righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer, and in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. So he convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The other thing we'll find again in the book of John, and it is in John chapter 3, verses uh, 5 to 6, is when Christ is talking to Nicodemus, and it is about the new life. This is what it records, this is what it says. That uh, in verses, chapter 3, verses 5 to 6, this is what it says. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and of the Spirit. And the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh. But the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. So we get, we, we get a new life. He gives us new life. The old passes and the new comes. This is a life that is full of joy, a life that is full of peace, a life that is full of patience, a life that is full of the godliness that God has called us into. Praise the name of the Lord. Then the other thing is that the Holy Spirit reveals God's love to us. The Holy Spirit reveals God's love to us. Unless it is revealed to us. Unless it is revealed to you, you can never taste it. But when you read Romans chapter 5, verses 5, this is what it says. Romans 5, chapter 5. I won't read. <clears throat> and hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. Remember, we are given. We did not go to buy. We are given. So we have been given the Holy Spirit to us. And therefore, we are not of uh, people who get disappointed. Even in situations that we are going in today, even in this COVID-19 and so on, we are people who live in hope, hope that does not disappoint us. The other thing is that the, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit empowers evangelism. He empowers evangelism. When we go again to the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 8, that is what Christ tells them. He says, But you receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and uh, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So, when the Holy Spirit comes to us, He empowers us. He gives us that power, the dynamics in Greek. He gives us that power to preach the gospel. We can never preach effectively. We can never preach with authority 
if we don't have the power of the Holy Spirit. Praise the name of the Lord. The other thing is that he teaches us what to say. The Holy Spirit himself teaches us what to say. When you read the Gospel according to St. Luke uh, chapter 12, verses 12, Christ is telling the disciples this, and I want to read it. 12, 12, this is what he said. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. The disciples are wondering what would happen, but they are told, don't worry. We will be taught on what to say at that time. He teaches us what to say. Sometimes situations in life will come, and you may not have words. You may not even know what to say. But the Holy Spirit gives us the words to say. And then, again, the Holy Spirit reveals God's secrets to us. He reveals God's secrets to us. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 2, chapter 2, verses 10 to 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 to 16. This is what the, the scripture says. But God has revealed it to us by His Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man, except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God, except the Spirit of God. We have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God that we may understand what God has freely given to us. This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truth in spiritual words. And you can continue with that. So the Holy Spirit reveals God's secrets to us. If you are living your life without the Holy Spirit, there are certain things that God had ordained for you that you might never know them. But when the Holy Spirit dwells in you, when He dwells in me, He will reveal to you, He will reveal to me the things that He would want you to know. Sometimes this may appear like it is ridiculous, but it is the truth. If you want to know how your life is, allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you because these things will be revealed to you. We will be looking later on perhaps on how He ministers, how He reveals God's secrets to us. But in, in a quick, uh, I could quickly say that this can happen through the word, the word of prophecy, the word that it could happen through dreams, it could happen through uh, uh, the revealed word, it's called Rema in Greek. So there are many ways that God could reveal. He could even reveal to us through preaching. So like now, we are having as a challenge in the COVID-19. We need to hear what is God saying about the whole of this thing. What direction should we take? It is not possible to know what God wants in your life or in my life unless we hear His secrets. Unless His secrets are revealed to us through the Holy Spirit. The next thing is that in John chapter 14, verse 16 to 18, Christ talked about bringing the Holy Spirit is bringing Christ's presence to us. This is what it says in 14, verses 16 to 18. And I read, If you love me, now, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. The Spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you will know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as an orph as orphans. I will come to you. So he will come to us. He brings Christ's presence in us. When you're walking on the streets of Kiber, when you're walking on the streets of Nairobi, his presence is with you. And then the next thing that is number nine, he keeps us in touch with God the Father. He keeps us in touch with God the Father. When you read Romans chapter 8, verse 26, Romans chapter 8, verse 26, this is what it says. 
I want to read it now, 26, this is what it says. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with grounds that words cannot express. That is the Holy Spirit. Because He keeps us in touch with God the Father. God the Father knows all that we need, even now. But the Spirit will reveal. He will reveal our deep needs to God the Father. And there will be that ministry that will take place. If you read Jude, verse 20. Jude, verse 20. That is what it says. Jude, verse 20. That's next to me here. I want to read it for you. Jude, verse 20 says, But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit and pray in the Holy Spirit. That means you can pray, but you are just praying. And somebody else can pray and is praying in the Holy Spirit. By the way, my friend, how do you pray? How do you pray? Because prayer, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man, a very much. This righteous man is the one who prays in the Spirit. He prays with understanding of the Word of God. We'll be talking about prayer some days to come. The next thing that he does is that he teaches us about Christ. He teaches us about Christ. If you go to John chapter 14, verse 26, this is what it says. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. The Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. So he teaches us about Christ. And in 15 verse 26, he repeats again Christ. In John chapter 15 verse 26, when the counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about you. So he teaches us about Christ. Then the other thing that he does is that he enables us to find the truth. In John, then this one we can read in 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 to 6, that he enables us or he enables us to find the truth. Because you realize again that Christ said in his word, actually you can even read this in John chapter 14, verses 1 to 6, when he said in verses 6, he says and he's talking to the disciples, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John chapter 14, verses 1 to 6. So he enables us to find the truth. Truth is a personality. And truth is Christ himself. We need to understand that. So the other thing that he does is that he encourages us. The Spirit of Christ gives us what is called encouragement. Acts chapter 9, verse 31. Listen to what it says. Acts chapter 9, verses 31. It says, Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. The Holy Spirit is the one who encourages the church. And I want to throw a question to, to us this afternoon, this morning. Is the Holy Spirit encouraging you as an individual? Is the Holy Spirit encouraging us as a church? Because that is one of the things that he does. He encourages the church. The other thing that he does is to control us. In Romans chapter 8, verses 9, this is what it says. Romans 8 verses 9 won't read it. You, however, 
are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. You cannot belong to Christ and fail to have his Spirit. And then when you have his Spirit, he controls you. What do we mean by being controlled by the Holy Spirit? Sometimes you are angry, but you will not see. Sometimes <laughs> you want things to be done in a certain way. You have patience. Sometimes you see things going the way you would not want to, them to go, but you take action the right time. So the Holy Spirit controls you. You don't go shouting. You don't go accusing. You don't go fighting. You don't go showing off. You allow the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit controls you. You have become a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. So you are under control. You are, the rest, you are resting under somebody's arms. So it is not about you, but about him. It is not so much about what you know, but about what he tells you to do. So he controls us. That is what Romans 8 verses 9 is saying. Then the same book of Romans, chapter 14, verse 17. <coughs> Excuse me. Chapter <coughs> 7, 14, 17. This is what it says, that the Spirit gives us joy and peace. The Holy Spirit gives us joy and peace. There are people who have who never find joy in their lives. But it is good to be joyful. There is joy in the Lord. There is joy in the Lord. We will always be joyful if we trust in the Lord. Because we have hope. We have that blessed hope of eternal glory. So we have joy. Joy in the Lord. When we were in Sunday school, we used to sing a song. I go, joy, 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 down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. I go, joy, 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 down in my heart. Down in my heart. There's day. Joy. And then peace. There are many, the world does not know peace. People in this day don't know peace. I don't know whether you as an individual know about peace. But peace comes from God. Peace is given to us through the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, my peace I leave unto you. We need peace. We need peace in our hiding places. We need peace in our homes. We need peace with our neighbor. <coughs> we need peace with those around us. Let carpets do not give us peace. But we can get peace through the Holy Spirit. So he gives us joy and peace. Even in the midst of COVID, we can be joyful. In the midst of COVID, we can have peace. When our businesses are closing, when we don't know what tomorrow holds, we can be at peace. The next thing that he does to us is that, and again it is recorded in Philippians chapter 2, verses 1, is that he draw us into fellowship. He draw us into fellowship. When you read Philippians chapter 2, verses 1, <clears throat> that is what it says. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, <coughs> excuse me, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, if you have any encouragement, because there are those of us who are discouraged, life today is very discouraging, but if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, from being united because you need to be united with Christ. If any comfort from his love, comfort of his love, knowing that we are there in those everlasting arms, you let the comfort from his love. And let me tell you something, friends, 
you will not find any comfort in this world, but you can find comfort in his love. If in the fellowship with the Spirit, in the fellowship with the Spirit, if in the tenderness and compassion, oh my, we find joy, we find peace, now we find love, we find comfort, we find tenderness and compassion. We are his children. We are God's children. And I'm telling you, we can find all these things and more. So he draws us into fellowship. And you know in fellowship, in true fellowship, and you can still read this in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. In any fellowship, there is unity. And we know that unity is strength. In any fellowship, there is comfort. In any fellowship, there is tenderness and there is compassion. And then the other thing that we find that he does to us, he enables us to lead lives, the Christian life that we're supposed to lead. Romans chapter 8. I want to read verses 1 and then I move to verses 5 and 9. Romans 8, it says, there, there, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the, for the law, because Christ, through Christ the law of the spirit of life sets me free from the law of sin and death. And then in verses 5 to 9 it says, For those who live according to the sinful nature have their mind set on what the nature desires. But those who live accordance, in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It will not tithe. It will not give the things that God will do. It will not go to fasting. It will not even go to prayer. It will not go to the reasoning of the word of God. It fights the word of God because it is a sinful mind. It is a hostile mind towards God. It does not submit. In fact, the scripture goes on to say, it does not submit to God's law. There are many people who are calling themselves Christians today, but they don't submit to God's law. Nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. And we need to be careful. We need to keep on asking ourselves, are we being controlled by the sinful nature? Or are we being controlled by the Spirit of God? Because... If you're controlled by the sinful nature, then we can never please God. And that also means whatever we do, we will keep on failing. You, however, he goes on to say, you, however, verses 9, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you, and even one does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. Do you belong to Christ? Or do you belong to the world? Do you belong to Christ? Or do you belong to the world? Where do you belong? Because you cannot be in two places at the same time. You are either in Christ or in the world. So where are you? If you are in, the, in Christ, you must bow to his lordship. If you are in the world, you come and tell us about what you are, the things you have, but that will not take you anywhere. Next point, I think point number 16, no 17, he works his fruit in us. He works his fruit in us. And this is well written in the book, uh, in the book of uh, Paul writing to Galatians. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 25. That is what he says. By the fruit of the Spirit. Now listen to this. I love this. By the fruit of the Spirit is love. Do you have love? You have the love of God. Because again, love is in many forms. I'm talking about the love of God. It's joy. You have joy in the Lord. Because there is joy in the Lord. Do you have that smiling face? Do you have that joy? It is peace. Those who belong to God have inward peace. It is patience. It is kindness. It is goodness. It is faithfulness. 
gentleness and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. I remember sometimes in 1994, Reverend Timothy Joya speaking about this. And he was talking to us about peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And I was in the youth, and there was so much we had to talk about self-control. So my friends, do you have self-control? Do you have self-control? Do you have self-control? And then, the scriptures here says that The scripture here says that he gives self-control. He gives that, those, that kind of a fruit that he works his fruit in us. We must allow him to work in us. It is us to go and allow him so that the fruit is manifested. And then Romans 15, uh, Romans 15 verses 16, it will talk about <clears throat> sanctifying, sanctifying means that we are made clean every day. I give an analogy of a vehicle. You wash your vehicle in the morning and then you drive through the streets. Of so, the Holy Spirit also sanctifies us. And if you have a vehicle and you clean the vehicle in the morning and you drive through the streets of Nairobi, Karwosho, Huruma, Kawangware, Kibera, Masaimara, whatever. By evening, although you had cleaned your vehicle, it will be dirty again. It will be required, it will be required to be cleaned again. And that is what we mean by sanctification. That although we are good Christians in the morning, we keep on mingling with people. We keep on mingling with the sin, with the dust of this world. Not now the physical dust, but the sinfulness of this world. And so we need to run to Christ for cleansing, for washing, for sanctification. So Romans 15 verse 16, this is what it says. Um, and I read, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles with the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. So why do we minister? So that people may be sanctified. That's why we sing this song. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed by the blood of the Lamb? Never think that because you are a minister or because you are an elder or because you are a church leader that you don't need sanctification. Sanctification is a daily process. Sanctification is a daily process. Whoever, however high or low you are, is a daily process. So we need to be sanctified. And you can still read this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13. And then again in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 to 11, he gives us gifts. And this is something that I love. There are different kinds of gifts by the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service by the same Lord. There are different kinds of working by the same God works all of them in all men. Now to each one of the manifestations of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another, the message of knowledge. To another, the message by, by, the, by, by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous power. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between Spirits, what we call discernment. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit. And he gives them to each one just as he determines. And friends, 
I feel like one day I need to talk about this chapter 12 and I explain more about it because the nine gifts are very important for a growing church. They are very important for a church that is going to, 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 to have the model that Christ would want it to have. But for now, it is good to know uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 to 11 about the gifts that are given to us. Again, he gives us his sword to fight Satan. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, when we talk about the whole armor of God, then we talk about the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. We can never, even if we have the whole armor, we need then the sword to fight demons, to fight the powers of darkness, so that we are able to make it. And that one will be given by the Spirit. Then, the next thing is that, when you go again to the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 26, there is what it says, he prays for us in times of crisis. Read, I want to read Romans 8, 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with grounds that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. So the Holy Spirit intercedes for us in accordance to God's will. Why? Because when you go to the book of Psalms 39, you will realize that God saw all the days of our lives, even when we had not lived one. And he saw all what would happen. The Holy Spirit, because he is God, has seen all this. So he knows what is important for me today. He knows what is important for you today. So when you are interceding, when he is interceding, he intercedes according to the plan of God. Sometimes for us we may intercede according to what we see, according to what we know, but he intercedes according to this plan of God that was predestined, that was, that was planned long before we were born. And then he intercedes according to that plan so that the prayers that we are praying by the help of the Holy Spirit reaches to the Father and then the things that the Father had ordained at that particular time, they are manifested in our lives and oh, hallelujah, we grow, we experience the blessings of God, we experience the power of God, we experience the miracles of God and behold, the fulfillment of the Lord is manifested in our lives. And then finally, because I can talk about this and continue talking, is that He will raise us from the dead. Romans 8 verses 11. This is what it says. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. So even if to die, you are to die. And you die in Christ. That same spirit will raise you up. And you find yourself in glory heaven. You find yourself forever with him. Because the spirit dwelling in you, the way he raised Christ, we also raise him. So for those who are in Christ, they don't fear death. They don't fear anything. Because they know one day they will be raised by the same spirit. And so this morning, as we conclude, may the Lord help us to know that we cannot live without the Holy Spirit. May the Lord help us to realize that when we allow the Holy Spirit in our lives, there are so many things that will happen to our lives and we will never be the same again. May the Lord bless us. May the Lord continue to be with you. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we want to thank you once again this morning for speaking to us about the power of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We pray that we are not just going to be the hearers of the word, but also the doers of the word. That even as we continue in the midst of darkness, we will know that we are not alone because we have a helper who is with us. Continue to bless us and to encourage us because it's a humble prayer of faith and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. 
May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and grant you his peace. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a good week. Thank you.